What's up guys? Welcome back to Title Gardens. So I was looking at some comments on some past videos and on my video where I talked about the five corals that we really can't propagate here for one reason or another, someone had asked, can you make a list of the five or so corals that you really do love to propagate? It's like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. So let's get into it. The first coral on this list, I would have to say, it's pretty predictable, but it's going to be Acropora. Acropora right now, and perhaps for the past few years now, has been the hot coral. There have been some other corals here and there, like some really fancy mushrooms and whatnot that have kind of taken center stage for a while. But I think that the last couple years at least, it's been the domain of really high-end Acropora. So for a coral farm, I have to say that Acropora tend to be one of the most rewarding corals to grow. And it's for a couple of reasons. It is, generally speaking, a fast-growing small polyp stony coral, but it's not boring. Like there's plenty of fast-growing SPS corals that are, I hate to say it, they don't exactly ever really get anyone too, too excited. Like, when was the last time you got super excited about, let's say, an orange plating Montipora, for example? I mean, they're awesome corals, but it's not exactly the same sort of energy that you might get from acquiring a home wrecker or Walt Disney, that sort of thing, right? The high-end acro market has a completely different feel to it. Another aspect of growing acros that's kind of nice is it always keeps you on your toes. Acropora, just by their very nature, tend to be very sensitive. They tend to be challenging. They require pretty much the pinnacle of flow, lighting, stability. And if you are able to give them all those things, they reward you with outstanding coloration. But there's also this nuance in that coloration because they are so... Uh, they're so finicky about their conditions that it's always fun to kind of tweak every little micro parameter to see if that will instill better coloration in what you're growing. I would say that acros, from a coral farming perspective, it's an exciting market. It is a challenging coral and it's a very responsive coral to grow. Some mix of all those things definitely lands it as the first coral on my list. The number two coral on this list is Ganiopora. For the longest time, Ganiopora, you're pretty much lucky just to keep them alive. They've developed a really poor reputation over the past 30 something odd years, but I would say in like the last five years or so, people have developed some husbandry techniques and this, I would say, is kind of like the golden era of Ganiopora. There are way more variety than there has ever been. Like when I first started into, into this hobby, there were two colors of Ganiopora. There were brown and there were green. And no matter which variant you purchased, they would be dead in six months. So nowadays, there are extremely bright colored ones almost like this kryptonite green color. There's like a speckled green. There's like the deepest, most fluorescent reds. Lots of interesting color morphs going on in a lot of these Ganiopora. There's a lot of these rainbow varieties that are very highly sought after. I mean, we're talking probably like $900 a frag sort of thing. And I'm enjoying tracking down any and all of those variants. Now, granted, there is still this element of challenge in there. For example, we had just purchased a couple of, um, of the Amazeballs variety, which is arguably right now one of my absolute favorite corals, and they're not happy right now. Anyway, despite that, despite that little setback, it's a lot of fun to kind of go on this little Pokemon hunt for all the really interesting color morphs of Ganiopora. It's, again, a challenging large polyp stony to grow, and I just love the aesthetic of it. Now, I guess the only thing that I would also add that makes it somewhat worrisome to propagate 
is I always feel like I want to propagate them more. But I think there really is like a minimum size that you should be cutting these things to. You don't want to overdo it. For us, we're comfortable with anything that's like a half inch or larger. Anything less than that kind of risks the colony. Moving on. The number three coral on this list is the coral formerly known as Acanthastria lordhawensis, and that is now Micromusa lordhawensis. These guys, for a little while, weren't the best things to farm, and it really came down to our inability to keep them very well fed. There are plenty of corals out there that will do just okay without spot feeding, and then there's others that the, the difference between spot feeding and not spot feeding, it's practically a different coral altogether. And Micromusa fits right into that category. There are tanks where they were kind of in a suboptimal location, so they just kind of got overlooked or just didn't get fed enough, versus the ones that we had, we had selected and put in some prime real estate, and we actually took the effort to turn off the pumps, feed them like crazy. I would say that each polyp on the fed side would probably be close to four times the size. The coloration is amazing on these things. So I've got this newfound, I guess, excitement for propagating Micromusa again. Now, kind of similar to Ganiapora, one thing that we always struggled with is cutting them too aggressively. And because the Micromusas tend to, um, they grow so large, I mean, I'm talking some of these polyps are basically small scalemia looking guys. They are still a stony coral. They have a skeleton and that is really what you're cutting, right? It turns out that the skeleton is still very, very tiny. So you might have what looks like a softball sized colony, but really the skeleton way deep down in there is probably like the size of a golf ball if you're lucky. And it doesn't really make for the best cutting. It's kind of like this test of one's patience, let's just say, because you just have something that looks so massive. It's like, let's get this thing ready to cut. Gotta wait. Let's go on to number four. This coral used to be in my top one or two corals when I was starting off in the hobby, and it is Blastamusa. Blastamusa, for a little while, I would say for like the last 10 years or so, didn't exactly excite me too much. There were like the reds, there were like the greens, there were like the red and greens. But lately uh, we've noticed more and more color morphs kind of popping up. Occasionally back in the day you'd find something crazy like, like a peach colored one or something like that. But now I think that since there's more collectors involved, there are more, you know, people looking for like the really weird stuff and then taking the time to propagate it. There are some really interesting uh, like paint splattered ones. There are uh, some that are practically like blue in color and red and blue and then red and yellow. So a lot of diversity now in, in Blastamusa. They are easy to propagate. They heal very well from cutting. Now, the only kind of wrench in the operation as far as like long-term aquaculture goes is that I've noticed that sometimes Blastamusa are a little bit susceptible to like weird bacterial infections. If you've kept stony corals before, have you ever seen like where a stony coral's skeleton will just turn pink and then it'll recede back and then die usually? That kind of thing can happen with blastos and it's kind of unclear why that is, but it totally does happen. So this is a situation where propagating more actually helps out the coral because when we propagate, we oftentimes dip in like a disinfectant like iodine to kind of like also clean the saw, clean everything. And it's almost like when we do a whole bunch of cuts, perhaps one down the road will develop that bacterial infection, but the rest of them are fine. We start propagating again. And it seems like we run into more of an issue if we slow down on the propagation. In a weird sense, we have a hard time growing some giant colony of Blastomusa but we're really good at growing a whole bunch of small frags of it. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. But anyway, that's number four, Blastomusa. The fifth and final coral on this list is Favia and Favites. And I really shouldn't lump those two together so readily just because 
they are very different than one another. They are the, you know, the Favia type brain corals. They are very different in growth rate. So the Favites, smaller polyps, Favia, bigger polyps, the Favia tend to be super slow growing. Favites grow rampantly. The thing that gets me gravitating to Favia and Favites is that they're easily one of the most diverse when it comes to colors and patterns. Pretty much anything you can imagine as far as coloration, you will be able to find it in these two corals. Very cool stuff. They cut easily, they heal very well from cuts, and we have a, probably the most in-demand one that we currently have is called like a Meltdown Favia. And one time, not that long ago, this was probably like a couple months ago, we had one in our quarantine system and something just went super wrong in that quarantine system. I think basically it went through a weird second cycle. So we actually were having detectable ammonia and nitrite. Clearly not good, right? This coral, as well as many others in that tank, just straight up lost all their color. It went to completely brown and started to lose flesh. I had low hopes. Kind of upset because it's a very nice coral, but low hopes for survival. We kind of rushed it into a more stable system. And pretty much after a few days, uh, the flesh loss stabilized. And then it started to slowly get puffier and puffier. And then now we're about maybe, like I said, maybe a, about a month or two out. And it's completely regained its color. So it's a very forgiving coral. Again, there's a lot of really cool colors and everything that you can find in this. And the key as far as fast growth goes, Favites don't really need your help. They're going to grow. Favia is something that you can just stuff food into. And when you stuff them with food, they reward you with halfway decent growth. It goes from completely like turtle pace, super slow sluggish growth to something that you can actually work with. And it's really cool to see them add additional mouths because the, the polyps almost like internally divide. And so you just start to see them like develop more mouths and then they start to separate and, and they have these concentric ring patterns and it's cool to see how the mouths form and then separate and then form the patterns. Anyway, cool stuff in that regard. That is our top five list of my favorite corals to propagate. See y'all next time. Happy reefing.